from the 19th century in textual criticism that's just basically no longer relevant in light of the discovery of the papyri and things like that. Um, that's not how you do it do it there either. But um, uh, okay, not anyway. from Wikipedia itself, unless you're using it generally to explain something, okay, which we all do, which I do at times as well. Maybe that'd be his fallback. Okay. So there's where, um, what happened is, the first thing we played, Dr. White, was from the discussion where I asked him questions and he asked me questions. Mm -hmm. And then there was some back and forth because I said, let's debate Matthew 28, 19. He said, I won't, yet he made a 4.5 hour video. And this is, these are clips are all from the 4.5 hour video. Right. But in the meantime, there was some Facebook back and forth before he blocked me for trolling, he says, oh. which is ironic because the only time I would come around is when he mentioned me, which he did frequently. He made several videos before this 4.5 hour one. So I said, why is Ron Shields' Divine Prospect using as evidence for excluding Matthew 28, 19, the Syriac palimpsest, which doesn't even include the whole pericope of Matthew 28? That's what I asked. And I basically said, because he doesn't know what he's doing. That's right. why. Right. Yeah, I saw that. I saw yeah. that. Right. And, and it's interesting, by the way, even in that Syriac palimpsest, I looked up the synoptic gospels, what they contain. And this is interesting. In that Syriac palimpsest that he points to, to say, well, look, since it's missing here, because the whole end of Matthew 28 almost is missing. But wait a minute, does he ever mention what a palimpsest is? He does explain what a palimpsest is, yes. Okay. But it's interesting, in that old Syriac palimpsest, when Luke ends, it says at the end of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And when Mark ends, it actually says in the Syriac, because I looked up some articles about what the text contains, it actually says the gospel of Mark is ended. My point by saying that is with the other synoptics in this Syriac palimpsest, when they're done, it actually says it. The, whoever translated actually did that. The Syriac palimpsest is pretty much the world's oldest translation, probably, for out of the Greek. That's true. It's a really old translation, but it's still a translation. But... We don't have all of Matthew, and if it was going to be consistent with the other synoptics, it probably also would say mm -hmm. the Gospel of Matthew, or the Gospel of Matthew is ended. But it, it doesn't. So just to show that he was trying to act like maybe that's really all that really was there in Matthew. Mm -hmm. That's what he was trying to say. Now, I would love to see an image of that folio leaf of the end of Matthew 28 in that Syriac palimpsest, because... If it's ripped or whatever, I don't. The thing is, there's not images of that online that I was able to find yet. For example, the Dan's Wallace Center, they don't have it. It's not readily accessible. There's only a couple leaves here and there. For example, he pulled up one from Matthew 1 because I said, Do you have the actual leaves? Do you have images or do you just have this printed text edition? He said, Oh, I have it. But he did something from Matthew 1 because he found one of the readily available images that are out there of the Syriac palimpsest because there are some, but he didn't pull it from Matthew 28 because I don't think that's available that I can see online. Hmm. All right. Uh, well, here's, here's, um, here's what he said. Um, he said, and he put us another question, which manuscript of Matthew answer those, which include the ending of Matthew, since that is a section where the verse under scrutiny is. Now that's very interesting that he's saying that, but again, he's limiting textual criticism to a singular approach, and he's not looking at the eclectic approach that I take. Okay, now I'm sorry, um, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, um, and I, I guess this this is a good good place. There's going to be more to more opportunities to reiterate this, but if everybody who has a desire to to chip off disciples to follow after them has found one of the ways to do that is to question uh, biblical texts and the accuracy of the biblical texts, things like There's nothing new about this. You've got Joseph Smith's inspired translation. You've got uh, the much more uh, fancy way of mistranslating things in the New World Translation. But, but, but if you're going to get a following, uh, you need to have some new stuff, and one of the best ways to do that is to question the validity of the text. What you have here... Uh, if if you any, anybody can do that, I mean every group on the planet, you can find somebody somewhere that said something that you can isolate, normally take out of its context and apply to your your pet text, because we're talking about a text. Now it's a whole lot easier to do this with the Old Testament, right? Uh, because you're talking about an extremely ancient text, some of the most ancient writings that we possess. Um, but even with the New Testament, uh, you're, you're able to do this, uh, despite the, the huge manuscript tradition. 
the point is that the first thing that a serious textual critical scholar wants to do is to produce as close to the original uh, in the original language. Now, my understanding is, I got, I got to the point where he started explaining, well, you know, my view is I, I favor the Eastern text. In other words, he's, he's going to translations right. before going to the original. This is, this is not how you produce the New Testament. And your comments were based upon what would be, you know, he would say is just simply the tradition that is common within uh, New Testament textual scholarship, and that is uh, the primacy of the original language. Well, right. Um, if, if someone were to uh, want to recreate the writings of Ron Shields um, 300 years from now, does anyone seriously suggest the way to do that would be to start with the French translations or go to the English, right. which was his original tongue? Um, Any time that you engage in translation into another language, the question of the accuracy of the translation, the accuracy of what the person possessed when they did the translations, is one of the first things that has to come into mind. And so when we look at Matthew 28, 19, he even reads a number of times, as I recall, um, statements saying all extant manuscripts, Greek manuscripts, of, that contain the ending of the Gospel of Matthew contain Matthew chapter 28, mm -hmm. verse 19. Now, there are manuscripts of Matthew that are partial. Right. I keep calling it my manuscript as if I own it. I don't. But uh, P45 uh, contains a, a relatively small portion of Matthew in the middle chapters, but it doesn't have Matthew 28, 19. It doesn't have Matthew 28 or 27 or 26. Right. Um, but no serious scholar suggests that the fact that you have a partial manuscript that only has fragments from the middle portion of a book means the beginning and the end wasn't there originally. If you then find later manuscripts that consistently contain the same material all the way through, no, no one will seriously suggest, and there, I'm saying seriously here, right. in other words, if you're actually trying to be fair in recreating the original text, no one's going to seriously suggest that those earlier partial manuscripts mean that what's missing was missing for them. They're just simply partial manuscripts. And I did see when he summarized at one point his arguments, right. one of the points of the argument was a lack of material prior to 300 um, uh, Papyri-wise, well, that would get rid of the majority of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because, for example, for Mark, the only serious papyri evidence that we have at the moment is P45. Um, uh, John, by far, has the, er the earliest papyri attestation, but even that's fragmentary. Um, and so, uh, you know, Matthew and Mark both suffer there. We've got a lot of Luke and John. But that's just because of the nature of papyrus manuscripts. And in comparison to any other work of antiquity, we still come far closer to the, to the original. The gap period. is way smaller. But, what did Bart Ehrman right. say in your debate? You asked him a question The New about Testament that. is by far the most early attested text of antiquity. Right. right. Yeah, there's no question I about it. I think that's on a coffee cup or something like that. I, 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 th I put on a shirt, actually, once, just for the, right after the debate. Uh, so this time. book by the Elans, which almost everyone you know has as an intro text, he has it, and... He's using this palimpsest in Syriac to try to overturn what's in the Greek almost, mm -hmm. but he should have read number five. The, this is, these are the 12 basic rules for textual criticism mm -hmm. on page 280 of this edition. Number five says this, the primary authority for a critical textual decision lies with the Greek manuscript tradition, with the versions and fathers serving no more than a supplementary and corroborative function, particularly in passages where their underlying Greek text cannot be constructed with absolute certainty. And that's important because as I looked into this, I saw Metzger say, and I thought this was important, that the Syriac cannot distinguish between the Greek aorist and perfect tense. So that means when they translate, and they wanted to be faithful, and that's part of what 
I understand why these early translations are important. Partially, it shows missionary activity. It also shows sort of the philosophy of the Word of God as they try to translate faithfully, we see. But the Syriac translators, because of the linguistics of the matter, could not distinguish, because Syriac can't, between Greek aorist and Greek perfect tense. That means there's certain aspects of the Greek text you couldn't even reconstruct in detail if you wanted to. Do. We have to remember, and, and this is this is if 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 you've sort of tuned us out at this point, you might want to tune back in here. You have to remember that when you're you're looking at the sources that we we have to reconstruct the New Testament text, Greek has to be the Greek manuscripts have to be primary for a couple of reasons. What are the sources do we have? Well, we do have the other uh, translations. We have. Old Latin, Syriac, the Peshitta, Boharic, Coptic. We have early translations. We also have the early church fathers, so what would be called patristic sources. But those are always secondary, as the Alans uh, emphasize there, for a number of reasons. Um, if you have a translation, that translation can, in as you just noted, uh, in certain languages, will not be able to tell you what the original Greek was. Those would be in grammatical issues, where, where the variant has to do with whether it's an aorist mm -hmm. or something like that. But they can tell you whether a verse was there or not. So they, right. they could be relevant at that point. Right. But the problem is, if it is a translation, um, how much material did the original translator have access to? So in other words, the translation cannot be any better than the Greek manuscripts, script or scripts, right. which we don't know, uh, from which the original translation was made. And even then, how far back are our man do our manuscripts go of that translation? Because we find variations within translations. Anybody who has, I keep forgetting to do this. Ah! Remind me when the program's over to grab one of my UBS texts and drag it in here so I can show it to folks. Um, especially when you use uh, UBS 5, which is the current uh, edition, there will be, in the textual footnotes, extensive citations of the fathers. But you'll notice it'll say, say things like Jerome uh, 1 slash 3 which means one out of the three times that Jerome cites this, it reads this way. That means two out of the three times, it reads the other way. Or maybe if it's a, a really complicated variant, it might be once he does it this way, once he does it that way, once he does it that way, and then he does something else over there. Um, it can be extremely, extremely difficult. And that's because uh, the early church fathers are frequently quoting from memory. Uh, just as we do when we preach or we write, we you know sometimes don't bother to look something up. It's easier for us to look something up faster now than I think it was for somebody even back in then. Hebrews. It says uh, somewhere. Yeah, somewhere it says somewhere, somewhere it, it says, says. <laughs> da, da, da. yeah exactly. So so you have that kind of thing going on, and so there are necessary limitations to what patristic citations and translational material can provide to us. Doesn't mean they can be ignored. But to make them primary and not even, you know, maybe someplace he has, not what I heard, was there any argumentation put forward as to why in the world you would make a uh, translation primary over the original language? It's, it's like I said, if, if two, three hundred years from now or two thousand years from now, uh, someone's doing a, a PhD on uh, Ron Shields, which would make him feel really, really good, even after 2,000 years. I'm Mission sure. accomplished. Uh, exactly. Um, Victory lap. Uh, and, and they decided to not use Ron Shields' writings in English, uh, but in translation into French. Or if they translated it, say, into Lashawan Kodash. Wow, that would be <laughs> really difficult to come up with, yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to do that kind of thing. Obviously, you go to the original language. That's going to be determinative of everything else. And you judge the translations based upon the original language. And that's why uh, modern scholarship um, does not have any questions about Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, And that's because the primary source for the book of Matthew is the Greek Matthew. Now, there's people who theorize that Matthew is originally written in Hebrew and Aramaic and all the rest of that. So we don't have any manuscripts of that. And what is very clear in light of the grammar and syntax is that the Matthew we possess today was written in Greek. Right. The individual who wrote it in Greek knew Aramaic. 
because there are Aramaisms in it, but it was itself originally written in Greek. And any, all the speculations, and there's a lot of speculation, if yeah. you want to get a paper published, you got to come up with some new angle, and so you speculate about what the original would have read, blah, 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 blah. We don't have any of those things. They're all speculation. And the reason that there's no question is not because we are just missing Ron Shields' uh, insights into textual criticism. Uh, it is because of the fact that when you have a text that is consistently found in every witness of the book in the original language back to the earliest manuscripts, then you have to have a mountainous reason to overthrow that primary evidence. And there is no mountainous reason. It's conjectural emendation without any literature exactly. to validate it. Exactly. And, you know, miniature bibliography, Peter J. Williams, foremost preeminent textual critic, has an article called, and so... Uh, if someone wants to look more into this to, to understand this truth, Google this, find this article. Some problems in determining the vorlage of early Syriac versions of the NT. Vorlage means the text before the translator. It's that original one. Look that article up. It's from 2001. And one more by Sebastian Brock. Limitations of Syriac in representing Greek. And that's in the early versions of the New Testament by, uh, by edited by Metzger from 1977. So there's books that actually even specifically mm -hmm. explain the limitations of what you can get to in the Greek using Syriac. And so this is something that um, um, people should look into before they jump to the Syriac to try to overthrow the Greek. Yeah, it, it's, it's fascinating to me because uh, Syriac is definitely extremely important in Quranic studies, yeah. uh, in what was available to Muhammad or to whoever the author I of the Quran a book, was. Uh, published by Brill on that subject yes, entirely right, by right. George somebody. There's a bunch of, of, of uh, discussion of those are those earlier languages and the influence they have on the language of the Quran, and and so there's you know the the early Bible translations into Syriac and their impact upon the Christians in in uh, what would be Saudi Arabia today, the the Arabian Peninsula. So it it it's it's fascinating, and I, I guess I didn't get to this, but you told me that. He questions whether I was even aware of these manuscripts. Uh, yeah, that's on the clip if you want yeah, to play. Yeah, well, it's, uh... Yeah, uh, it's, uh, well, we should we should probably get back to this. We, we're only a minute and thirty five in. We're obviously not going to get through all this, but but he confuses uh, my my emphasis upon the uh, necessary textual critical reality of the primacy of the Greek with uh, the fact that yes, I'm quite aware of the Coptic, Boharic, Sahidic, uh, all the other translations uh, that that are are necessary to cite, but again, they're secondary material. They're not primary material. I think it might be clip 14, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, let's, 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 let's stick with what we got here. Um, but, but there's the primary thing, and that is, when someone questions Matthew 28, 19, they cannot do it based upon any meaningful textual critical theory, which must take as its primary source the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, in which the, that's the language in which the New Testament was written. Um, they can't do so. And so they either have to, as he uh, quotes Coney Beer and some others, they have to engage in redaction criticism, uh, form criticism, uh, depending on whether you're talking about redacting the text later on or the form that the text originally possessed. Uh, and those two end up frequently coalescing in, in liberalism. But he is utilizing forms of liberalism uh, in, its, in its approach. Um, the problem with that is there are no rules. Right. Because if he wants to use it there, then someone else could come along and use it on his favorite texts. And that's been the, the dead end of the liberal approach to Scripture, is that you end up with nothing. There's, there's nothing left to even have a conversation about, because I can dismiss, theoretically, your favorite text, and you turn around and dismiss mine. I and think have... his is Psalm 82. Well, you, you know, and the funny thing is, there is, there is uh, there's really absolutely no question that as far as the distance between original writing and first documentation, we have better documentation of Matthew 28 than we have for Psalm 82. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, just time-wise, just because of the, the way in which Old and New Testaments are, are, are transmitted. But if he applies the kind of liberalism that he used in Matthew 28, 
the Old Testament's dead meat. Right. I mean, that's why get, I asked him about Jesus's use of the yeah. Old Testament for that exact reason. I, I mean, I don't even. I, how do you even come up with a meaningful text of the Old Testament from that perspective? You can't. You can't go to the Syriac or something for that. Right. Now you're really going so far down the road from the original writing that it's that, that, that it's it's ridiculous. An article I'd also recommend one more from uh, Jets 1977 Journal cool, Journal of Evangelical Theological Society is by Grant Osborne an article entitled this Redaction Criticism and the Great Commission a case study toward a biblical understanding of inerrancy and he deals specifically with Matthew 28 and really the whole surrounding verses 18 19 20 mm-hmm. which are sometimes called into question really based upon uh, a bias in the theological presuppositions, not on yep. literary or physical grounds, upon theological presuppositions about supposed development of Christian theology. That's where it comes from. It comes from a presupposition about church history, really, yeah. and about the clarity of what happened during Christ's lifetime and, and the church's understanding of that. Not anything physically rooted. It's it's almost like a, a blind faith type of, you know, well, we believe this about this. So we'll we'll overthrow the physical evidence. Well, that, that, unfortunately, that's that is the essence of liberal biblical scholarship today. Uh, you, when you ask Bart Ehrman uh, why he does not accept Pauline authorship of the pastoral epistles, he'll point to differences in um, uh, terminology and lexicography and vocabulary. That's primary. And secondly, he has a theory of what the early church looked like, and it doesn't fit that. Right. So where so where where does he get his theory? Uh, what sources are, is he using to develop his theory of what the early church looked like? Uh, it's extremely circular, and unfortunately, many people uh, today don't have the critical thinking skills to be able to challenge uh, what they find being quoted regularly on CNN. That's because the people at CNN don't have the same critical thinking skills to be able to uh, actually question the scholars that they're quoting either. So it's very very. Uh, it's strange for me to hear someone, on the one hand, utilizing methodology uh, that would then turn to the other side, would destroy the very foundations of the text that they themselves use. He does a similar thing about understanding of church history with the Ebionites. He believes yeah. they're the true heirs of what Christ That's taught. what the Muslims say. Yeah, he thinks the Ebionites are the go-to. Unfortunately, and, um, the only thing we know about the Ebionites is, is, is passed on to us through Christian sources. Yeah, we know very little. He very little. the same thing with the, the group sometimes called the Nazarenes. Right, right. 